And so with that, let's get started. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today for another one of our COVID-19 response calls. Um, my name is Heather Alshuler. I'm the Strategic Initiatives Director at the George Pocock Rowing Foundation. Uh, just in case anyone on this call doesn't know who the George po uh, Pocock Rowing Foundation is, uh, we are an organization that is committed to helping forever change the way youth find, start, and stay rowing. Um, we run various programs, including our national school-based program called Earth Ed that introduces thousands of students to the sport each year. As well, we have helped youth overcome barriers to participating in the sport, um, such as the barrier of cost um, with our need-based scholarships and support. And we also have a partner network of boathouses that are working together to better the sport through being more intentional, inclusive, and innovative. Um, and in that spirit of bringing boathouses together, uh, the GPRF wanted to provide a space for us to discuss the situation we have all found ourselves in, in um, at this time. And today specifically, we're going to be focusing on the financial reality of this situation. Aligning with our mission and vision of the GPRF, uh, boathouses need to be able to survive this time and be able to open their doors once again on the other side of all of this. Um, there's going to be no greater need, desire, um, for people to reconnect with their rowing communities, teams, and water once again. So with the idea of sustainability and financial survival, I'd like to turn things over to uh, the executive director of the GPRF, Matt Lacey. Hi, everybody. Uh, so nice to see so many friendly uh, little teeny faces uh, up in the menu bar. Um, you know, last week, uh, I was going through uh, with Eric Poon, uh, who's on this call. Uh, on this call, I'll introduce him in a second. But um, at the Pocock Foundation, uh, there were about 48 employees, and so we were definitely navigating the per, uh, Payroll Protection Act. And there were some uh, just uh, questions about navigating that process. And uh, um, as we went through it, in the very same week, we were looking at some. Uh, or a strategy to uh, negotiate some rent forgiveness uh, down at the Rent and Rowing Center. And then I caught this email from Rachel Lemieux um, that listed out uh, a, a number of things that I wasn't even aware of yet uh, as far as supports that were coming around the corner, uh, the ability to defer or get some extensions on tax payments. And I just realized there really are a lot of resources that are coming out to play and seemingly more every week. And so I thought, uh, it would be terrific to go ahead and then use one of these calls uh, to get uh, primarily administrators. You know, I mean, everybody's been doing such a terrific job in connecting with their their communities. But uh, I thought it would be helpful to go ahead and take a look at all those supports that we're aware of at this point, uh, financial supports, and try to get some Q and A on on how to navigate them uh, and get some information sharing. There's a possibility of some other local foundations that might be doing some work to support the athletic or uh, the rowing community, possibly. Uh, but let's get a space out where we can start listening and learning to what's going on as far as supports out there to help us navigate the financial side of this crisis. Um, I thought it also might be helpful, uh, given that two folks we are uh, going to be listening to over the course of this call, uh, Rachel Lemieux, uh, who's a CPA, a I don't know how you want me to start, Rachel. I mean, is it a, uh, the coach for Martha's Moms and that you're a beloved member of the rowing community or uh, that your professional life has you, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, out there as a CPA and financial wizard? Um, and it's just a gift to have that level of expertise uh, right here in our own backyard. And we also have Eric Poon, uh, who's a board member for the Pocock Foundation and um, also a CPA uh, working with... Um, uh, with Microsoft on some international transactions. In any case, we've got some heavyweights out there that were helping us work through the PPP and aware of these um, supports and that they can help us just through Q&A, you know, maybe uh, just help us navigate with our board treasurers or if uh, administrators are doing it themselves, how we're going to start navigating, uh, navigating these supports. And the last uh, reason I wanted to get this call together was primarily just this uh, almost a brainstorming. Um, some folks are doing some pretty creative things out there to make sure that they're sustainable and uh, they're ready to get back in the water once once we get the go ahead. Um, so first off, I know we're going to lose uh, Eric uh, Poon. Eric, are you there? Uh, all ready to uh, to talk about the PPP by any chance? 
Hello. Can you hear me? Terrific. There he is. So I'll Great. turn it on over to Eric. Hi. I know we're going to lose Eric here in a couple minutes. And so I just um, wanted to let him talk a little bit about the uh, payroll protection program and, and our experience with it. And then I'm really encouraging everybody on these calls, get questions into the chat. Uh, Heather's going to navigate and keep an eye on that chat. And uh, uh, let's let's talk about the, the PPP first, and then we'll move into a terrific email. I hope everybody got it. Um, if you RSVP'd for the call, uh, Heather sent out uh, or forwarded an email that we got from Rachel last week, which uh, also details out a number of the supports and some tools that we can use to, to navigate them. But we're going to start off with Eric, uh, and then we'll lose Eric, and sure. then we'll move into uh, Rachel. I'll pass it over. Yep, sure. I'll, I'll keep this um, relatively high level and, and brief, and then um, to the extent you, um, there are questions about this, um, we can field them on this call. Um, also, I'll provide my um, email address, and I think um, and you can contact me direct, directly um, to, to help or to, to um, answer any questions you have. So I think at kind of like um, a starting place is that the um, payroll protection uh, or paycheck protection program was a um, program that was uh, enacted as part of the uh, CARES legislation that was passed, I think, around three weeks ago. Um, it offers um, at uh, just a really summary level um, the opportunity um, for uh, small businesses. So um, and that includes private foundations, um, charities, um, LLCs, corporations, as long as you have less than uh, 500 employees, um, allows you to take out a, um, a loan to support um, that you can use to use, um, that you can use for payroll expenses and to a lesser extent um, utilities and rent. Um, but if you, if you use at least 75% of the loan that, that um, you receive from the government um, or the loan that you receive, then it, it is um, forgivable. So in the end, it turns into kind of um, basically a grant from the federal government um, for you, um, so long as you use it to um, keep your, um, or use it for, for payroll um, expenses. Um, the process um, with the rollout of, of the act and the rollout of this program has been um, relatively bumpy. Um, there hasn't been, um, the guidance from the government has been um, delayed and um, it, the, the program really relies on um, foundations or organizations working directly with their private banker. So there's a number of private banks or there's a number of banks um, that uh, are accepting loans, um, but it, they're typically only accepting loans from existing customers. So that has proven to be a difficult um, part of the application process is just finding if you don't have an existing relationship with a bank or the right relationship relationship with a bank, it's been uh, difficult to, to apply. Um, however, um, it's still, it is, it is funded at 350 billion. And I understand that there's an, ex an extension has been um, requested by um, the secretary of the treasury to extend it to um, by another 250 billion. So roughly around, um, uh, roughly around 600 billion, um, but 350 is currently funded. Um, here, just to bring it back to the Pocock Foundation and kind of our experience, um, it you know uh, it's it's a relatively simple application to fill out. Um, I think the hardest part is um, finding the right bank and the, and the, or, or tapping the right banking relationship. So you have the the first step is is to apply through a bank. Um, um, after that. Uh, the calculation of to determine how much the loan is is really um, looking at what your um, 2019 average payroll expense was. Um, that includes everything from your benefit expense, if you offer health insurance, to um, wages for hourly employees and salaries for employees that make um, under 100,000. So um, it's just basically taking that payroll expense and that that 29 expense or 2019 expense figuring out what the monthly average is uh, and multiplying it by two and a half and that determines your loan amount um, 
so we thought it was um, a you know a relatively simple application to fill out. However, it was difficult to figure out who the right uh, bank was to use it. Um, I think if um, you're you know, we highly encourage you to reach out to existing board members or to um, you know or to your existing banks who may have knowledge um, about this program and and apply as as soon as you can. Um, so that's those are that's a very very quick high level overview. Um, do you have any questions? Uh, looks like we've been getting looks like uh, looking at some activity in, in the chat, but any questions um, to go live or that you'd like to discuss now? I have a quick question. Um, sure. Uh, so I've got a staff of about ten, um, and they get paid hourly. Uh, we've applied for the loan. Um, my concern is, you know, obviously they have a much reduced uh, hourly commitment right now. Um, <clears throat> they are doing some stuff helping us with our virtual coaching, but not nearly as much as they would have otherwise. So my concern is I'm going to get, if I get the loan, I'm going to get a chunk of money um, that will be equivalent to what they were getting paid, you know, last year. Um, is there is there any chance that, you know, I won't qualify to get it forgiven if I'm not providing them with the same number of hours or even close. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, yep. That makes complete sense. I think it's, uh, we view this as, you know, a, um, and I'll just kind of talk about it in terms of a, a POCAC. You know, we think about this in general in terms of it's a facility that it's a, it's a pool of money that you can use to fund your payroll expenses. If those payroll expenses don't actually materialize or you don't actually have those um, those payroll expenses, then you can repay the loan, um, at, you know, uh, without a penalty. And I think interest uh, begins accruing, uh, I believe, six months after, or the, the the first payment of interest is is you know six months um, after you receive the loan. So um, if if at the end of the eight week period you don't actually, you know, you have unused funds, I, I think. It's um, you can then use it to you can then repay the amount that that you loan that you didn't use for a qualifying um, for a qualifying expense. So so just to be clear, I w I can pay back the part of the loan that I didn't use, or I have to pay back the entire loan. My my concern is that I'm going to end up having yeah. like a quarter of the outlay, and I don't want to have to pay back the whole loan. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. So let's say let's just say it's a hundred dollars, right? Let's say your your loan was a hundred dollars. You spent twenty five of the dollars on uh, payroll expenses, right? Qualifying payroll expenses, um, and you um, you can then spend, you know, I think um, you know, a, 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 I think up to I have to get the math. I have to think about the math here, but you can also spend a, a small portion on the utilities, right? Let's say you have utilities for your for your boathouse and your facility. Um, Whatever, let's say it's that's that's five dollars. So you have seventy unused, thirty used. Um, my understanding is you can take the seventy and and repay it, repay the seventy, and then apply for forgiveness for the thirty. Okay, okay, great. But I think those reg uh, the regulations have all been around uh, how you apply and the amount that you're able to receive. Uh, that's all the guidance I think we, um, that the Treasury Department has issued. Uh, there hasn't been much uh, guidance about repayment. I think they said that it's for it's um, for coming. So uh, more details. Obviously, I think more details will will come on that. But that's my general understanding. And and this is Rachel. Just to just to kind of continue on with some of that. Um, again, this is a ever evolving program. Um, even today, we are finding out uh, additional changes that are being proposed. So this is something that we're going to need to continue to pay attention to almost on a minute by minute basis in terms of providing information. So again, in terms, um, Nick, uh, you, uh, just reiterating what Eric has said, payroll costs, which is a which is a all encompassing amount, right? So if you if you are um, healthcare, all of those types of things that go into what makes payroll, 
um, can be this money can be used for rent. So if you're renting the facility, you can use the funds to uh, defer rent or not defer to pay rent and utility, as Eric said. So there are uh, if, if for whatever reason you have in a mortgage um, on your land or building, you can use it to pay mortgage interest as well. So there there are a number of activities that this money can go towards, not just payroll. Yeah. Um, there is a question on the chat function um, from Pat Tyrone. Um, so the question was for the PPP, can we also use some of it for rent? If so, um, if we prepaid our rent in January for the year, can we use a portion of our rent costs anyways? I think you sort of answered that, but in terms of the prepayment. I, uh, yeah. I don't know the exact um, answer to that. So Eric, I'm not sure if, if you do, it's something that I can find out, but the bottom line is if it's going yeah. to towards rent, you should, you know, again, one would presume, and you have to be very careful with that, uh, that you could use that money to defray those costs. Yeah, my, my understanding is once you, the day you receive the loan, there's an eight, there's a clock that starts ticking for eight weeks. And it's that eight week period that you look at, well, what were my costs, my, my costs for that eight week period, to the extent that they were related to payroll, which is kind of all encompassing as Rachel mentioned, um, utilities, rent or mortgage interest, you can take um, your loan proceeds and apply and use your loan proceeds to pay um, those expenses during that eight week period. To the extent that you do use your proceeds to pay for that during that period, then it's, um, it's forgivable as long as I believe your payroll expenses are at least 75% of your total expenses. Um, don't, um, I still have to, I have to look back at the regs to figure out how that 75% is calculated. But if you use, I think the rule of thumb is if you use a majority, at least the vast majority of your loan proceeds on payroll reimbursement, then, then it's forgivable. But it's really it's it's that eight week clock that starts on the day that you receive um, the loan. So to answer Pat's question, you may have prepaid you may have prepaid your um, rent for the year. Then you take your uh, monthly rent or your weekly rent average for the year, um, multiply it by um, eight, and that should be the amount um, that would be allocable to that um, to the period for the eight week um, you know the relevant period for the PPP. We have another question cool. in the um, chat function from Ben Quick. Um, how risky would it be to give staff bonuses to consume any unused balance on the loan? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, concept, interesting question. Um, I I believe there is a um, there are two elements that are required as part of at least that I understand that part of the loan forgiveness um, piece. Um, one is you have there's a um, you have to report your full time equivalent count, um, and then you have to um, also um, report what your hourly wage was um, during that period. I don't think there's any, um, I can't think of any limitation that um, there is for giving bonuses or for increasing wages. I, I think the only limitations are, are around when you decrease wages and you drop, you drop wages, um, is, is, there, um, is there a potential issue to, or where you potentially disqualify for loan forgiveness? Let me look, at, let me look into that a little bit closer. Um, see if there's if that's if there's anything in the regulations that preclude that but I can't think of anything off the top of my head or um, based on what I've read so far Rachel have you have you yeah, heard of that have, being an issue I have not, and I wrote that down as something to follow up on as well um, the, the act uh, when it was first signed is 880 pages long so you can imagine that that all of us are scrambling to <laughs> understand uh, all 880 pages of it. Um, you know, I, I would be cautious about paying bonuses to get up to the 75% if it's not a normal practice. However, that's, again, uh, don't take that word as gospel. Uh, between Eric and I, we'll check into it and, and uh, send 
general answers back to Heather who can get it out to everybody else um, that, that is existing on the call. Um, there was another question about um, new hires and if they hire someone to help out virtually doing, during this time, um, is that acceptable under forgive payroll? Or does it have to be an established employee before this period? Uh, I don't recall anything that specifically um, um, addresses that. Um, I think it's, I think payroll expenses are, I think that my understanding of the regs was that if you reduce the amount of payroll that you have or the amount of FTEs, full-time equivalents, then potentially the, your ability to, to take <clears throat> loan forgiveness um, would be affected. But if you increase payroll, um, I, I didn't see that as affecting your as affecting um, your ability to get forgiveness. I think if you increase your payroll, I think that's probably um, you know maybe within the spirit of this of this act, which would be to stabilize or increase um, you know uh, people who are employed by small businesses. Uh, uh, I think that's another another question we'll follow up on. Eric and Rachel, are you aware of any limitations around consultants uh, or contractors and bringing them on at this point? Can you use those funds for um, for those folks? Eric, I, I, <laughs> a 1099 contractor uh, is not necessarily a payroll um, element, and there are provisions within the various acts to allow for a 1099 contractor themselves to apply, right? So um, when, when you think about it, if you're, if you're going to bring on a consultant, that consultant has the ability to apply in and of themselves, but not through payroll. Um, Eric, do you have anything different to say on that? No, I think that's, that, that sounds right to me. Yeah. I mean, we have coaches that are 1099 contractors as opposed to W-2 employees. And um, so far we have found that the 1099 is not part of uh, acceptable uses for the PPP. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sitting now and trying to help uh, employees or independent contractors go ahead and apply for the loan and they're outright just, to, you know, is kind of the direction that we've shifted on that rather than trying to get them to cover under payroll. Hey, Rachel. Mm -hmm. um, just a just a uh, confirmation um, when you're talking about your your gross payroll costs too. My understanding was that those gross payroll costs cannot include the employer's portion on federal taxes. So that when you're figuring out the basis of the loan, it isn't just fact wages and, and benefits, but the the, um, the the employer's portion on federal taxes is not included in that basis. I'm, I'm going through my head, Eric, if you know the answer right off the top of your head, go through. I'm trying to, there, there is a provision that one or the other does not qualify. So I think it is the employer's portion that does not qualify, but yeah. the employee's I, portion does. Taxes are good. That's right, that's right. Uh, we, yeah, we backed out FICA. We backed out FICA yeah. from, our, from our calculation. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, just uh, waving at Heather, I think if uh, uh, if we run out of steam on questions surrounding the PPP, um, we're going to lose Eric here in a couple minutes. Uh, we've still got Rachel on for a little bit longer, but there were a number of other programs that uh, uh, and resources available that Rachel highlighted. Uh, and so if we don't have any more questions on the PPP, then we can uh, move on. And uh, Eric, thanks so much for jumping on and, and helping us through this. Yep. Yep. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. But I do want to make sure, yeah, any other questions that are still out there um, about the PPP, even whatever you can get into the uh, the group chat, we'll keep an eye on. And if we don't have an answer, uh, we'll turn it up and then get it back to you uh, over the course of the week. Okay. Yeah, so we'll turn it on over to Rachel uh, to talk about some of the other help out there. Great. Um, I was going to try to figure out how to share my screen. Here it is. So bear with me, everybody, as I bring up a couple of things here. And let me know when you can see it. It's on, Rachel. Okay, perfect. 
So we have um, uh, the firm I work for, BDO, uh, has uh, generated a few tools, and, and these were the tools that were sent to everybody in a separate email. And so this one is, in fact, the CARES Act, and it basically comes in and, and talks about whether you would qualify or should apply for a small business loan versus the employee retention credit. And our, our determination um, at, at my firm is it would be better if we could get everybody to, to apply for uh, the loan versus the credit. However, you don't always, you know, you don't qualify necessarily for um, the, the, the loan. So you might have to go down to the credit and, and vice versa. Um, but again, this just gives you an idea of the steps and it might be very small on your screen. It's, it's a large flow chart, so it's hard to see. But the first thing obviously that you're doing is that you are looking at whether you have had to um, partially or fully suspend right? Uh, your, op your employees, um, your employer's operations, right? So have you in fact lost money related to COVID-19? And I can say that for the vast majority of the rowing community of city, the, the, the answer to that is probably yes. Um, and then if, if you are, right, then you, you just, you go ahead and you say credit or loan. There's also another program that's called the Emergency um, Loan through the Small Business Administration, which is a little, the, 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 things that you can apply for for that, which aren't on this particular sheet, um, you can apply for that just about at any time. You really didn't need to have COVID-19. You did need to have an emergency declaration, which uh, 42 states or 43 states as of last week have in fact declared um, emergencies in their state. So the, the ability to go to the SBA for an emergency declaration loan is, is also um, available and things that, that people should be looking at. Um, loan forgiveness is, is the biggest thing. And, and Nick, you brought up some really great questions about whether or not, um, you know, what's gonna disqualify me from complete and total forgiveness. And so as long as you pay attention to um, the various factors and say, if you do the 75, 25% um, uh, um, you know, allocation of use of the funds, then you should not have to repay, right, those loans. And in the not-for-profit community, um, you know, whether we get, it, whether we can take advantage of a credit or not, uh, if we are doing like the, the payroll credits is uh, kind of, kind of, it, it, is that really applicable, right? Because we're 990s, we're typically not um, subject to taxes unless we have unrelated business income. So, um, whether we get to apply for that or not is is, is another issue and, and one that needs to be taken uh, very close attention to. Now I am trying to get my screen back, so give me one second here. Then Rachel, you've got a couple questions about the emergency declaration loan. Um, mm -hmm. Just one from Pat. Is it the same as the EIDL? That's it. That yep. is it. It is uh, the same as that one, yes. And my question was, uh, are they exclusive, the... Um, the PPP and the emergency declaration loan, can you pull in both uh, or are they exclusive? If you go for one. Uh, um... they, are, they are not exclusive right now. And the, you know, because, because again, the other loan already exists out there. You could walk in tomorrow and, and it, but for, you know, COVID-19. So uh, what we need is, a, is an emergency declaration. And so whether we had it because of COVID-19 or whether we have it, let's say you have a flood or an earthquake or earthquake or something like that, and, and you're in a county, right? Maybe it's not statewide, but maybe it's a county where um, emergency has been declared. That's what qualifies you to go in and get those loans. Um, so, uh, you know, again, um, there are at least three programs that everybody can take advantage of, right? Um, payroll protection, uh, the SBA small business loan, or the emergency loan, um, and all of those things will, will help uh, get us through this particular period of time. Now, as Eric mentioned, um, the programs uh, just on Saturday, Sunday, and this morning announced going out and getting more funds because we in in the accounting world completely anticipated this which was it you know, the portal opened up on friday uh, a week ago and by probably monday 
a great deal of the money had been theoretically claimed that was out there. Um, and yet, uh, more than half the businesses hadn't had an opportunity to uh, get their loans in or get them approved. So Congress right now, if you, if you don't have your loans, and I don't mean to discourage your applications, and I don't mean for that to discourage you to go out and apply, everybody needs to get in line and make these applications because uh, we also anticipated that the government would start extending uh, the amount that they were going to make available so that it, we could get this spread out as much as possible. Um, I'm glad to see in the chat box, and again, I am really trying hard to get my, <laughs> to get my screen to come back and there we go got it thank you whoever did that so i can i can see um and i really appreciate that folks have been asking the questions because they've already applied for their loans now from what i know i didn't see anybody that has received a loan in the pacific northwest but i have seen on the east coast that folks are in fact getting their loans and you were correct somebody noted in there that it takes exactly 10 days and that is absolutely correct um, as Eric pointed out, having a banking relationship is incredibly important. We did a survey of and called all of our personal banking relationships in the Pacific Northwest, and there were only a couple of banks that were willing to accept loans if you were not loan applications if you were not a bank customer. So you had to be a bank customer at that particular bank in order uh, to make the application. So again, only two small banks have been willing to allow you to come in and make an application without being a customer. Another bank, Chase, and, and in a way, again, this is my personal opinion. Uh, I want everybody to realize personally, I was a little disappointed in Chase Bank because they said you had to have been a bank customer by February 15th in order to come in and uh, be eligible to apply for a loan we did have a client that unfortunately got caught in between. He changed to, Ch to Chase on February um, 16th, and we didn't know at that time, obviously nobody knew at that time, whether um, that Chase was going to put something on there, and he had left his prior bank. Neither bank would allow him to apply for the loan, so that was um, disappointing, and we had to scramble to find another bank um, uh, to get him to, to apply for that loan. It is so much easier if you have a personal banking relationship, like Eric says, to call them up and say, can you help me get through uh, this loan application? Because some banks require way more information than other banks. And having everything in order is, um, is the best advice that I can give prior to, to submitting that application. For the emergency loans that I was talking about, they actually have a very simple uh, loan application online and it, you, you go in and you answer like 10 questions and it says you qualify and then it will you know kind of direct you towards what you need to, to kind of go further down um, down the path with with them and getting those loans um, other than that i just wanted to make sure that we got this information out um, i could make my uh, if um with the sharing that you got, the my email address should be available on any of that, but if it's not, let me know, it's pretty simple. Um, it's rlemieux at bdo.com, and we can get any questions that you have answered. Uh, one of the things that we are looking into uh, that we have not found the right answer for yet, uh, and, and Matt, uh, you may have an answer, and anyone else that's already gotten their loan may have an answer, but for boathouses that have more than one club inside that boathouse where the primary landlord is leasing rack space and that rack space is exclusive uh, to that club, whether the loan um, money can be used by that club to cover their rack fees. Uh, the question is whether that's a license to use or whether it's a rental of real property. So far, we have not gotten a definitive answer on whether exclusive rack space within a larger boathouse qualifies. So I don't know if any if anybody has faced that problem, thinks that they or didn't ask the question and they think they can use it. That is a, a to be determined uh, important piece of information because there are clubs out there that have exclusive rack space, but not necessarily an entire um, a, an entire boathouse. I don't see anything in the chat that's come up from anybody about that. 
And actually, as Rachel looks through the chat, if uh, anybody does not have an established uh, banking relationship uh, at this point, uh, there's a gentleman in the rowing community, a guy named Dwight Phillips, who works with Columbia Bank. And if you wanted to talk to Dwight, just uh, and you had any questions just about banking or starting up um, uh, or going through an SBA loan, as of last week, they had the same idea. They were not accepting new customers, but he was uh, talking with their regional vice president about uh, trying to find a way to open that up and navigate it. But if you don't have a, uh, a relationship with a bank or, or you just had some questions about uh, strategies for engaging uh, your bank. Um, Dwight uh, will get his contact information up and he's made himself accessible for any questions uh, that can help. I do see the um, I do see the question about whether the EIDL is uh, forgivable and it is not because it wasn't necessarily part of this overall program. It's just a program that we know that currently exists out there. Um, I, I know that in my position as a member of the AICPA's state and local tax resource panel, which is a mouthful, but it is a, it is AICPA is our, uh, essentially our governing body for all CPAs in the country. Um, we, you know, have been tracking um, a, a lot of this, and I know that we sent a letter to Congress uh, through the AICPA asking that Congress consider that EIDL programs be, um, uh, you know, also relievable and not have to be paid back. But again, that's, you know, who knows where that request is going to go, but it is out there on the minds of a lot of people saying, if I don't qualify under all of these various uh, uh, configurations for whatever reason, and I get an EIDL, can we also get that um, forgiven? Uh, but again, we don't know what the, the, the answer to that is. Do we have any independent contractors out there who have, in fact, applied for um, loans to, you know, gig workers or anything like that that have applied for loans and have received them? Don't think I see anybody there. Yeah, we have a couple coaches that are getting a little bit whipsawed, or not whipsawed, but uh, are in a little bit of a hard place because you know, uh, they they aren't an employee, they're an independent contractor, and, um, you know, whereas they just don't fall underneath the, the loan application, and therefore they're having a little bit of a hard time um, getting uh, loans. Now, Congress says that this week that they've started um, sending out all the money, but uh, again, people that I know uh, have not received their, their funds yet. One other thing, definitely, I mean, there are some other uh, uh, deferrals, and as far as uh, I know some of the taxes you'd be paying on payroll, uh, Rachel, that were uh, in that message, I mean, the ability to forego, I mean, I think you could defer, what, 50% of your uh, FICA uh, for the next six months or something like that, uh, yeah. but I also thought you might lose that ability to get that forgiven if you've applied for the, the PPP. Well, there is, you're right. There, you you basically there is. If you get one, you you don't get the other, right? So that's why you know we're saying that it would be better to get the loan than um, than say like the employer retention credit um, and and the like because you get one or you get the other. You don't get to qualify for both. However, the EIDL again is a separate um, is a separate loan program, but it, it is not forgivable at the current time. The other thing that um, I, I want to make you aware of is if you are in a state that imposes sales tax, for instance, on your activities, like much like Washington does, because we tax everything, um, the Department of Revenue and the city of Seattle and all of those, uh, all of our big local jurisdictions, we call them the five portal cities, Tacoma, Everett, Bellingham, uh, Seattle, and Bellevue, have uh, issued guidance with, that allows you to defer um, not only the filing of your taxes, but um, the payment of those taxes. Right now, we're currently out through June. Um, it may end up, the longer that the governor keeps us on lockdown and the economy in Seattle continues to be very, uh, a, kind of a trickle, uh, we feel that uh, any deadlines that are currently going out to June will be extended even further. So. However, my uh, advice to any club that owes sales taxes because you're collecting those on behalf 
of people, you know, on behalf of the state and, and remitting those would be to go ahead and remit your sales taxes and just defer the payment of your B&O taxes. And other states that have allowed, there's several states that have allowed for the deferral of uh, sales taxes. You know, I, I, I don't like it when people um, end up with a big balance due and take that 10% and use it for their own purposes. I mean, you're certainly, uh, you're certainly allowed under all of the relief provisions to not pay that right away, but to the extent that you don't pay it and later on you can't pay it, that is just a snowball problem waiting to happen of um, enforcement actions when we do come out of this because right now the states are not forgiving uh, into the future that you didn't pay your sales tax, right, that you rightfully collected from people. Although, again, another thing is you're probably not collecting any because nobody's paying you to do anything. You know, you're not selling anything necessarily right now. So, but if you're in Washington, you can call the Department of Revenue or you can go into your uh, DOR automated account and simply put in there, I would like a deferral um, to pay my B&O and sales taxes out to whatever date it is. Rachel, um, there's a question that came in about um, clarity surrounding um, in, in reference to the CARES Act, um, to tell donors about tax deductible contributions. Um, so um, even if you're not itemizing that donation, um, they could be tax deductible. Um, yeah, that, that is something that we're trying to um, also uh, clarify on the, there's got to remember a lot, we lost a lot of ability to take deductions for charitable contributions. Um, trying to build that back in and say no if I'm gonna if I'm gonna make that I want to go ahead and get that deduction um, so yes you do want to make sure that is it going to be deductible I you know I don't really at this point I'm like trying to help whoever I can um, uh, to go forward but yeah it, that is something that is still a question out there and I'll clarify uh, exactly how much we're going to get um, in for our 2020 taxes on that I saw something else down here that I wanted to there's a question. Um, on the 990 for nonprofits, uh, you're right. I, I was going to bring up, can you still see my screen, guys? I'm not sure if you can, but there is a, um, I don't have it open right now, but the chart that we've been working on as to uh, all of the extension deadlines for federal related taxes do not address not for profits right now and their 990. So, right now, as of today, we have not heard whether they are going to extend that due date. Um, and we did hear finally on Friday, however, for those of you that are individually make estimated payments for 2020, which would be due technically in two days, finally on Friday, they extended that deadline out. So estimated 2020 payments that are usually due April 15 are not gonna be due um, until July 15. Um, I have not gone through that entire amendment to figure out whether the 990s yet have um, also been extended. So I would operate on the assumption that they're due May 15 until you hear otherwise. Uh, Rachel, there's a terrific question here about uh, coaches moving on to unemployment um, and how that's going to impact the PPP. There are a number of other incentives uh, at this point. I don't want to call them incentives, but um, supports available. So if you do furlough a coach uh, or somebody in the organization, some of the support that's out there for COVID, I think it's up to $600 a week. Uh, they actually might be making more on furlough or on, uh, on unemployment than they would be making uh, as a coach. And so I think it's interesting if you can just speak a little bit um, uh, about moving a coach onto unemployment and how that's going to interact with the PPP because uh, it's coming up more and more frequently. Right. Um, actually, to be honest with you, I don't know the answer to that. I wish I did. Um, and uh, it is something that I can get and, and get out there. But we have to be careful because, again, all of this was a lot of these relief activities were meant to keep employees on the payroll. And when you move them off, you lose the ability to, to get certain forgiveness. So while the coach themselves may end up with a um, with an with an advantage, right? Or excuse me, while the club itself may end up with an advantage of not having to repay certain things, if you end up having to furlough employees altogether, there could be a portion of that PPP that is paid back. 
Now, if you have enough where you're doing family, you know, emergency medical leave act, um, anything like that, where you're doing emergency sick leave or emergency family medical leave act, there are some provisions in there that um, are advantageous um, in terms of being able to get um, a payroll tax credit. Um, uh, but again, um, you have to be very careful that if I get the money and then I turn around and have to furlough people, how is that going to impact my my ability to def to waive any repayment of that loan? Well, one, uh, uh, we've only got about 15 minutes left and I do want to make sure if you do have any questions, um, I mean, they're terrific. Uh, honestly, these uh, these questions, I don't know how much, uh, if we can carry on past the 1230 window, Rachel, if you've got a couple more minutes. Um, there's another question here that I want you to answer. And then I just want to leave a couple minutes while everybody's on the call, if they've found any other supports that we haven't talked about. Um, uh, lease forgiveness in particular. I mean, there are city, counties, and states that are providing um, lease forgiveness. So if you have that relationship, I know that some of that support is uh, is out there. And so if you haven't investigated, uh, definitely do. Um, some of them I, I'm aware that you have to uh, you have to ask and apply for, otherwise they just assume the money keeps rolling in. Mm -hmm. um, but let's, uh, Rachel, have you speak to this last question. Uh, do make sure we get those questions into the chat um, and we'll, we'll stretch this out as long as we have Rachel's time. Um, I do see there, Catherine looks like she asked the question about uh, employees cannot file for unemployment if they have not furloughed them. Correct. That's, yeah, you can't apply for unemployment if you still have a job. Um, and so you, you need to be, uh, employees do need to be careful with that. Um, and, you know, and then the other thing too is I, I suppose if they go down to a significantly lower amount of money, um, or again, if they're 1099 contractors or things like that, where they've been paying their uh, federal uh, taxes on their uh, personal returns and things like that, and they no longer get that, unemployment is still a possibility. But if you still have a job, you can't go out and, and apply for unemployment um, benefits. And just also definitely keep an eye on that 25% uh, uh, margin that you'd really have to be using in order to get this all forgiven, use that 75% of the PPP anyway, and make mm -hmm. sure that you're able to you know, keep that balance in mind. If you do start letting some employees off, um, make sure that you can use up at least 75% of that loan. <laughs> so the other thing, I'm sorry, uh, Matt, the other thing that Catherine, I finally saw at the bottom of, uh, as I scroll down, um, you're, you are correct, a lot of not-for-profits are self-insured. And one of the things that uh, in our profession that we continue to write, hey, be, be you know, we continue to notify Congress and do whatever, but it, it, it is, um, what is going to happen? Are you going to allow states or the federal government to suddenly increase rates in the future, right? And experience ratings and things like that in the future because of the impacts of COVID-19 and the need to lay people off or furlough people or whatever, because typically that would drive a rate up uh, in the future. And so we're trying the best that we can to make sure that um, six months down the road, as we hopefully come out of this, that we don't have the unintended effect of now suddenly our experience ratings all go up and we end up owing more in tax um, uh, later on down the road or our premium prices go up simply because of the automated calculations that uh, get made in terms of you know are you a company that brings them on drops them off brings them on drops them off in which case right you, you end up with a higher rate um, we're, we're trying to make sure that that doesn't happen but again it's just something to be aware of that uh, while well, we think it's a great idea. It doesn't mean that what we think Congress is actually going to do or state legislators are actually going to do. There was another terrific question there from uh, Lenny about the employee's ability to file for unemployment if their hours have been uh, cut back significantly. Yeah, I'm not an employment tax specialist, so I guess I'd have to look into that one as well. Unless anybody else is uh, aware of an answer, I mean, it's probably relevant only to Washington State, but uh, anybody else have a, an answer for that one? If not, 
uh, Lenny, we'll reach into, uh, we'll look into it and get an answer for you. Thanks. I, I think it is the case and, and uh, people can also, if, if employees are laid off and then brought back on reduced hours, they can continue to collect unemployment and subtract the earnings, the reduced earnings that they have from the, their unemployment benefits. Um, it varies state by state, but it's definitely something that people ought to look into because with the, with the extra $600 a week that the federal government is providing until July 25th, that may actually be a more economical and more efficient option than applying for loans and keeping people on payroll and paying payroll taxes and going through all that stuff. Um, if employees, I mean, most coaches in particular are part-time. And so um, most don't make $600 a week anyway. Um, but uh, it's definitely worth, worth looking into. Okay. Well, any other uh, you know, questions that we've got, either for Rachel or if there's anything that you're doing in particular that you think would be advantageous for your uh, neighbors and friends in the rowing world that we haven't discussed as of yet, uh, any strategies as far as dealing with employees uh, possible? I'm also curious to see if folks are uh, putting some of their staff on furlough so that they can capture some of those unemployment benefits. Um, uh, let's get them out here. We've only got a couple minutes, a uh, couple minutes left. And you know, again, if you need anything, if you're going to sign off and we're still in conversation, uh, get that question into the chat and we'll respond as able. So um, as an aside, I believe we are having, we, the, the firm uh, is having a, um, a seminar tomorrow on um, not-for-profits. I was just going to try to find my calendar here real quick. Matt, what I'll do is I will send uh, information um, related to that seminar if uh, it's probably a, it's a one-hour webinar that will be take place now it's for not-for-profits in general um, and not specific to any one industry within the not-for-profit world but it is something that if we still have space I'll get it sent out right away and and folks can sign up for that uh, that does not have a Q&A session in it but some of the stuff that I have uh, looked at in this chat room, um, I can certainly submit today and see if they cannot weave it into tomorrow's presentation. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. If anyone else has any questions, please go ahead, um, pop them up into the chat function now. And Rachel, if you have any last words of advice for the group um, we can start to wrap things up also um, like mentioned before uh, let me know if you did not receive that original email um, from rachel this morning from me via me yeah i was gonna say wouldn't it come from me would it come from <laughs> <laughs> would it come from somebody else but uh um, do let me know um, and anything that, that, that I can do to help. There was a spreadsheet that was included in the um, email that, again, very high level, but it helps you think about the questions uh, as to whether uh, you would, what, what program you qualify. And, um, and then again, if you want to reach out with any questions, I'm happy to help as much as I can. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for your insight, Rachel, today. That was very uh, valuable for us all to hear, even if it's just confirmation that people are doing the right thing. Um, and everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I will be posting the recording, so if you would like anyone to sort of tune in after the fact, um, you can access that through our website, pocockfoundation.org. Um, there's a button at the top that says Boathouse Leadership Calls. Just go ahead and click on that. Also, you can RSVP for our next call, which is in two weeks' time, um, April 27th at 1130 uh, Seattle time. And our next call, uh, the topic for that is going to be a little bit more focused on the pro programming side of things with uh, putting together sort of the next plan um, from, from the Boathouse director uh, level. So, you know, just thinking about um, what's next, potential summer programming and future plans, and just hearing from some uh, le leaders within our rowing community on sort of what they're looking at going forward. So again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It's always wonderful to see faces and connect, even if it's virtually, and just know that we're all going through a lot of the same things all together in 
um, trying to figure out how to survive through this and keep our organization strong. So thanks again. And thank you, Rachel. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, everybody.